What is up guys, Coding Jesus here, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about five different risk metrics that all quantitative traders and quantitative developers should know about. Now, why should quantitative developers know about this risk metric? Well, because quantitative developers need to be able to interact with quantitative traders. They need to know the lingo and be in the loop as to what quantitative traders are talking about. So if you're a trader, an option trader, or you're an aspiring quant trader, this video is for you. All right, guys. Now, why am I even talking about risk considerations? Well, before a quantitative trader goes ahead and executes a given strategy, he's thinking of two things. One, the potential reward, and two, the risks and the implications that come with those risks. This video will be about these risk considerations, but it's just as important to understand that every time a quant trader executes a strategy to manage his profit and loss, he is doing so with the expectation that he will gain a theoretical edge. That's where our first term comes into play. Theoretical edge is just reward. It is the amount of profit that a given trader expects given their assessment of current market conditions and various risk factors. Now, of course, one risk factor might look very manageable, and at the same time, another risk factor might be out of the bounds of what you're willing to accept in terms of the level of risk you'd like to execute on that trade. And that's why, while there is only one theoretical edge number, there are multiple different numbers for multiple different risk considerations, which is really the topic of today's video. So the topic of today's video are five different risk considerations that quantitative traders need to keep in mind. And quantitative developers, understanding these five risk considerations will help you go a long way. Okay, so what are these five different risk considerations? The first risk consideration is delta. Delta is otherwise known as directional risk. This is the risk that the market goes against the direction that you'd like it to go, all right? Every given option has a delta figure between zero and one or zero and negative one, assuming we're looking at vanilla options here, not some complex sort of structure that uh, is beyond the scope of this video. So let's say, for example, that I have an option with a delta of 0.5. What does that mean? That means that for every dollar increase in the price of the underlying contract, my option will gain 50 cents in value. That's where we come to the textbook definition of what delta is. Delta is the sensitivity of a given option's price relative to that of the underlying. So for every dollar move in the underlying, how much does the price of this option change? Now guys, this video won't have any fancy graphs or fancy charts because I want you to really understand the intuition behind a lot of these different risk considerations. And so I'm gonna be describing a lot of these risk considerations with back of the envelope examples and helping you understand the intuition behind them. Now, when it comes to Delta, Delta isn't static. Delta changes and we'll get there in a second. But another piece of terminology that I think is very important for you to understand if you're an expiring quant trader or quant developer is something called Delta neutral. Now, sometimes a given trader will construct a portfolio, making sure his portfolio is delta neutral. Now, what does that mean? It means that his position won't change in value over the course of the underlying moving through a limited range of prices. So if the underlying goes up a dollar or down a dollar, hey, your actual portfolio's value doesn't change that much. Now, I say limited range because we'll see in a second that delta itself can change. And that's actually one of the best transitions I could have possibly thought of off the cuff into our second risk consideration. Our second risk consideration is called gamma or curvature risk. Now, gamma, the textbook definition for gamma is what is the change in delta for every given dollar change in the underlying contract. Or gamma is the sensitivity of delta relative to a change in the underlying. In my previous example of delta, I mentioned a delta of 0.5. Now, that's a static figure, but like I said, delta changes over the course of an option's lifetime because the underlying will move. So as the underlying moves, delta moves because of gamma, right? Gamma is the risk of a very large move in the underlying regardless of direction. So let me give you a more concrete example. Let's say we have that option, once again, 0.5 delta. That means for a dollar increase in the underlying, like I said, the options value will increase by 50 cents. But after that dollar increase, the next dollar increase will have a larger change in the actual value of that option. So instead of, once again, increasing by 50 cents, it might increase by 51 cents, right? That is a gamma of 0.01 because the delta has increased from 0.5 to 0.51, right? The gamma is that addition to, it is the derivative of delta. Right, so it is the addition to delta after a given dollar move. 
Now, what does gamma mean in a more practical sense? Well, gamma measures the speed at which your option becomes more valuable, meaning if your gamma is positive, your delta will change at increasing rates. Therefore, a given move in the underlying upwards will lead to a higher theoretical value much quicker. That means that if, you know, if you're a quantitative developer, a quantitative trader, and you're trying to think of the risk implications here, what does it mean if, I hold, if I'm holding a positive, a positive gamma option? It means that there aren't many risk considerations to consider if it's positive. If the gamma is positive, the value of your option will increase at an increasing rate. Now, if it's negative, that's when you need to start thinking of the implications of a negative gamma on theoretical edge. Because the price of the option or the value of the option decreases or deteriorates at an increasing rate, which is something you want to keep an eye out for. Our third risk consideration is called theta or time decay. Now, what the hell is time decay coding, Jesus? Well, time decay is the loss in value of an option over time. To really understand time decay, we need to understand where an option derives its value from, and it really does that from two sources. The first is intrinsic value, and the second is time value. Now, intrinsic value is simply whether the option is in the money or not, right? Let's say we have an option, a call option with a strike of 10, the underlying is at 15. Well, we have intrinsic value of around $5 there, 15 minus 10. The option is in the money. Time value refers to the odds that the option will become in the money over the course or over the lifetime of this given option. Now, time value decays over time, meaning the closer you are to expiry, the higher time value decay is. Now, if you're buying options, time value, or theta rather, is negative, meaning you are losing money by holding that option, right? Because the time to expiry is becoming less and less and less and less. Your option will either expire in the money or it will expire worthless. And the amount of time that you have for it to expire in the money is slowly, slowly, slowly decreasing, and therefore, the theta decay is becoming larger, meaning the value of your options is eroding. When I say theta decay is becoming larger, I'm saying the magnitude of theta decay is becoming larger, but in the negative direction, right? So your theta decay might start at maybe 0 0.001, but when you're closer to expiry, it might be 0.1, for example, in the negative direction, of course. All right, now there's a very interesting relationship between theta and gamma. On a negative theta option, so if you buy an option, you are long that option, you have a negative theta. At the same time, you have a positive gamma because you benefit from large moves. Now, why do you benefit from large moves? Once again, guys, I said the value of an option is derived by the odds that it can become in the money. That's a time decay component, the time value of an option. And if gamma is very large, there's a larger chance that you will swing into the money than you would with gamma being very, very small. Now, conversely, if you are short options, you are long theta, meaning you have a positive theta. If you have a positive theta, you have a negative gamma. That's a rule, guys, remember it. Positive theta, negative gamma, negative theta, positive gamma. That's the relationship between the two. Where an option benefits from large movements, it does not benefit from time. That's a good way to put it right there at the end. All right, our fourth risk consideration is called Vega risk. That's the word I was looking for, Vega, volatility risk. A very textbook definition of Vega risk is the sensitivity of a given option to a change in volatility or the underlying contract's volatility. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, guys, option traders or quant traders have volatility models. They have models, and part of those models are volatility. Volatility is an input into that model. It generates a distribution of prices for the underlying contract, and you use those prices to value the option. All right, what does that mean? Well, it means if you put in the wrong volatility, then of course your distribution will be wrong and your pricing will be wrong. But what I'm really getting at here is if you have an option that has a positive vega, it benefits from increases in volatility. And if you have an option with negative vega, it does not benefit from increases in volatility. All right, guys, now just a little tidbit here in terms of volatility. Oftentimes, traders aren't in the business of predicting volatility. In fact, I think there's only 30 firms worldwide that actually go ahead and try to predict volatility. Rather, they will get volatility from the market. What do I mean by that? Well, you look at the market and there's a series of prices for different options. Now, you're assuming that the market knows better than you because the market is a collection of hundreds of thousands of different actors that all 
you know, input their subjective valuation for that price, and the market determines what the current market price is. Now, instead of trying to predict volatility or model volatility somehow, oftentimes a lot of traders will talk about volatility in terms of implied volatility, meaning what does the market currently believe volatility is at? How do they get that? Well, you have a Black-Scholes pricing model, you have several different inputs, volatility being one of them, and you also have price. Now you can back out volatility if you have price, right? You have five variables, you know four of them, you can back out the fifth one. So that's really what implied volatility is. It's the volatility implied by the market given current prices. Now that was a little of a uh, tangent right there. Let's get back to risk considerations here. So the very last risk consideration, and it's last because it's least important, uh, I'm sorry, Rho, that's what the, volatility, that's what the uh, risk consideration is called. Rho is interest rate risk. And that's simply the risk that interest rates will change over the lifetime of a given option. Now, why is that the least important? Well, guys, oftentimes we have options that might be trading for a year or maybe less. And interest rates don't change that often. They might change every quarter, but they don't need to. And when they do change, they change in very small increments. This is in contrast to volatility, which is constantly changing and sometimes exploding or collapsing. So Rho is really the least important risk. An option with positive row benefits from increases in volatility, and an option with negative row does not benefit from increases in volatility. It will lose value with increases in, it's not volatility, sorry, interest rates. It will lose value with increases in interest rates. Let me just summarize that in case I said it wrong because there's no jump cuts in this video. I like to speak direct to you guys. An option with positive row will benefit from increases in interest rates, and an option with negative row will lose value with increases in interest rates. Conversely, a option with negative row will increase in value with decreasing interest rates. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. What I wanted to do in this video is give you a very high level overview of these five different risk considerations. Now, I don't like to use jump cuts, so I might have butchered a word or two in there, but I hope you can forgive me. I think I corrected that very last butcher in terms of row. I'm looking to make more in-depth videos as to each of these risk considerations, maybe make a video on each one of these, but I also wanted to make this video catered to non-quant traders, so prospective quant traders or quantitative developers that want to know the lingo. Because simply jumping into all these charts and all these numbers and all these formulas, it might intimidate a lot of people out there, and I really just wanted you to understand the intuition behind all these risk considerations. If you like this video, guys, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, double tap thumbs down. I have a Patreon link in the description box below, guys, if you want to support my channel. It goes a long way, and there's a lot of perks with new perks coming soon. If you want to join the community, I have a Discord link in the description box below. And if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's career coaching, mentorship, interview prep, etc., whatever you'd like to talk about, as long as it doesn't involve me taking off any of my clothes, I have a Calendly link in the description box below. And you can also email me at thecodingjesus at codingjesus.com. Thanks for watching this, guys, this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.